Nathan, my friend, have you ever owned a car that you regretted buying? Something that just wasn't very satisfying? Often. Often? <laughs> yeah. yeah, quite a few. I, fortunately, not right now, I'm doing okay, but uh, there have been so many times I've owned a vehicle where I just kept thinking, this is buyer's remorse. I hate it. I need to get rid of it. Yeah, I'm, and I've had plenty of those too. And I'm uh, a little bit younger than you. Just a hair. But in today's podcast, we've got a couple of really fun topics, starting out with a consumer report survey that found the 10 least satisfying cars and SUVs. And the number one car, um, the satisfaction is so low on it that I think you're going to be pretty surprised. We're also going to talk about some of the cool new cars and maybe less cool cars that came out of CES this year. Um, and then we've got a fun bonus thing at the end of this podcast, which you're definitely going to want to stick around for, um, surrounding the Enios Grenadier. So Nathan, let's talk about Consumer Report. So it's this big organization with paid members. They have all these member surveys, and they recently came out with this study, um, and this is from their website. Consumer Report analyzed data from our latest member survey to measure the current state of vehicle owner satisfaction. Combined with Consumer Reports ratings on testing and reliability, our owner satisfaction ratings give car buyers valuable guidance when they're shopping for a vehicle. And we got 10 cars that folks aren't very happy with. Starting with number 10, Nathan, what are we looking at? You're talking about that Nissan, huh? Yeah, we're talking about a Nissan. Oh boy, this is one of their volume sellers, which is what's, in my mind, kind of painful. But this is the Nissan uh, Altima, 48% um, would buy again. That's uh, not great at all. Yeah. That, that's, that's really horrible, considering that this is their most popular car. Right. When you look at, like, their sedan body shape, yeah. Altima is a really big seller. Um, yeah, 48%. So less than half of people, according to the survey, that bought their cars would buy it again. Um, now, look, Nissan is going to come up a couple times on this list. There's no way around it. But um, here's the deal with, with, with Nissan, right? Is mm. they're, they're slowly turning the ship around. Slowly turning the ship around. Um, I, they're not as disastrous as, say, Stellantis in my mind. Oh, wow, Nathan. <laughs> but um, I, I'm being honest. But wow. um, they're, they are at least showing signs that they, are, they, they have intentions to go a different route. A lot of that is electrification. I know a lot of you guys are against that, but regardless, that is one of the directions that Nissan is going. And some of their newest offerings have been pretty decent. Um, sales have not been great for a lot of their products. Uh, that's including their pickup trucks. Um, and in general, I think that Nissan is in, uh, in a little bit of trouble. Showing that the Nissan Altima is not exactly loved by people. Mm. One final thing before we continue, every single car on this list, we've driven a version of it. So yes. we are talking from a little bit of experience. So here's the thing, right? So Carlos Ghosn, who is probably best known for being smuggled out of Japan in a cello case. <laughs> um, look, he, 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 he basically leveraged um, um, the company and, and he, he, he prioritized short-term profits at the expense of innovation and long-term success of Nissan. Yeah. So he was a ruthless cost cutter, and you know he did save the brand twenty some years ago, right? But it, when, when in recent years he, he came out with a series of products that were acceptable, but they weren't the highest quality, they weren't very innovative, and they were built to a price point. Indeed. In fact, at one point, Nissan was a very close competitor to both Toyota and Honda in terms of quality, in terms of uh, the, the vehicles they actually had on offer, performance. They were very close, and in some cases, they even exceeded some of their competitors in terms of capability. Then, cost-cutting came along, and a lot of these vehicles suffered from a variety of different things, not the least of which was the JATCO continuously variable transmission, especially the early generations, yeah. which were horrendous. And many buyback vehicles, many warranty issues, class action lawsuits, a whole series of issues based on that. But they basically took what money they had and said, no, 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 we're going all in on this CVT thing. And for a while, pretty much everything that wasn't a pickup truck or sports car had a continuously variable transmission. Now they've turned the corner on that. They're much more reliable now. They are better transmissions, but not necessarily the best. And in addition, they've also changed some of their vehicles and improved them, in some cases, by removing that transmission. Yeah, and look, so Carl Scone out of the company, and we've really seen the ship starting to ride itself. So let's give mm -hmm. some examples, right? So we've got um, vehicles like the new Rogue, 
right? Huge steps up over the previous generation. I agree 100%. It's one of the better vehicles in this class. The new Pathfinder, right? They, the, Great. Yeah, the previous Pathfinder was just not good. It really had. It was a station wagon with, with a powertrain that just didn't really work for people. And in addition, it wasn't the best in class in any way, shape, or form. It wasn't even that competitive other than decent interior space. Although we do have some viewers. We're going to get some comments because... Believe it or not, as much as maybe we don't like the thir the fourth gen Pathfinder, looking back at it, um, there's there's a lot of folks that have good memories with them. But the current one, right, eight speed automatic transmission. Isn't it a nine speed? Uh, I think it's an eight. Um, V6 engine made an eight speed automatic transmission. Oh. Um, in the front wheel drive, is, a, is all wheel drive a nine? I could have sworn it was a nine, but. Um um, it is an actual automatic transmission. Oh, you're right. No, the article I'm reading, nine-speed automatic. Yeah, yeah 100%. Uh, so the nine-speed automatic transmission that they brought in is, I think it might be ZF, um, huge improvement, much more drivable, better off-road. Way better. Uh, and then they went from that, and then they made the vehicle a little bit more off-roady on top of that with the Rock Creek Edition, which we've had several times, and everybody here agrees the best Pathfinder over the past couple generations, at least. Not a truck yet, not quite as off-roady as the earlier ones, but still a great improvement, and I think a pretty damn decent vehicle. Yeah, right, and then of course we saw like the, the new Z, which was vastly improved over the old Z, right? So Nissan's been turning around, but there's, there's certainly like cars that carry over from that era where there's a lot of cost cutting, you know, not, not a lot of crazy impressive engineering, and the, the Ultima, I think, um, is falls in that category. Agreed, but some of the best seats in the business. They have that, excellent seats. That zero gravity thing, I drank the Kool-Aid, and uh, it's just a type of foam they use, really, and I think it's really comfortable, especially for my oversized American bottom. Um, I find that Nissan seats in almost all their cars are decent, but the Altima, if you get, I think you have to get above the, the base model to get those seats. Excellent seats. So, uh, and not a bad interior. I actually think it's a decent car. Except the drivetrain could use some love. Anyway, well, should probably move on to the next one, huh? Yeah, we'll talk about this engine again a little later on, but yeah. the variable compression turbo was a cool piece of technology. Sure. Um, so next up on the list, this is coming in at 47% would buy this vehicle again. It's Volkswagen. Um, it's the Jetta. Yes, and I think that just like you were talking about cost cutting, Volkswagen has really terrible taste when it comes to which cars they want to cut money on. The older Jettas, I thought, were great in respect to their performance capability, uh, flexibility and platforms and everything else. They were just really interesting cars. And then progressively, as they got newer and newer, going up to this generation, yes, there were, are some fast ones, which are fun, but the quality isn't great. Mm. And it really does feel like you're buying something that, frankly, you could get a better version of that through somebody else. I will say, in the Jettas kind of defense, right? It's very tough to find a car nowadays in the low $20,000 range. Jetta starts at under 22K, yeah. which is good, right? So, so there, is some, um, there is some value there. And I do have to say, like, I've driven some of the more current Jetta GLIs. Yes. And they're really good. Yes, yeah. the GLIs are. And they even had that sport one, which uh, you can get a manual transmission. You could still get a manual transmission in a small sedan, and that is one of the few you can actually do that in, which is great. But I think you'll agree with me saying that the interior quality has suffered quite a bit. They actually are going back to buttons on the steering wheel, thank goodness, uh, instead of those little panels that frankly aren't great. Um, so I think they're making some improvements and turning the corner, but I do feel that in the old days, Volkswagen quality was outstanding and some of the best in class, and now it's just kind of floundering. I went on the launch of the, um, the, the, the current GTI, mm -hmm. which is the Mark 8, and on the launch, they had the Mark 8 GTI, the Mark 8 Golf R, and then the, uh, the Jetta, which they had done some minor tweaks to. And getting in the Jetta and just using buttons instead of that <laughs> Volkswagen infotainment system was so refreshing. You know, it starts at like 28 grand for the GLI, so that's a good car. But according to the survey, folks aren't super happy with, with the standard Jetta. Yeah. So now a car, Nathan, I've never driven. I think you've spent some time in this. Not only that, but one of my closest friends actually owns one of these. So the, He's not a car person. The Kia Forte, 47% would buy again. Yes. So the Kia Forte is a very simple vehicle, and it replaces the Kia Accent, or Kia Accent, the, it replaces the Hyundai Accent as one of the lower ones, that one and then the uh, Hyundai uh, Venue, 
those are like the least expensive cars that are Hyundai Kia. Uh, the Forte is not a bad vehicle in terms of overall build quality. It's decent. Um, not fast. Not at all. Mm. Um, there's really, it's an excellent rental car. <laughs> um, that's about as good as it. But um, the, the Forte, at one point, they even made some sporty ones. They had a two-door Forte for a little while, which was awesome. I remember that. that was was a lot, it was cool. a fun little car. But Kia fell out of love with the Forte a while ago and was, is building this one basically to fill up rental fleets sure. and have an entry-level vehicle. And that's exactly what this is. Um, I would imagine that this will go by way of the Dodo in the near future. But for now... They still managed to sell quite a few of them, and it is their uh, value leader. With that all being said, terribly underpowered car, terribly underpowered. With the exception, I've heard of the Forte GT, 201 horsepower, yes. turbo engine, multi-link suspension, dual exhaust, manual transmission still available. So uh, that is an attractive um, vehicle to yeah, me. Yeah, but that's not the volume seller. That's not, not the volume close. seller. No. no, no, you're right about yeah. that, right? Like if you get an LX, it's going to be pretty dreary. Ew. It's cheap. Under 20K starting, but it's, uh, it's not going to be much of an enthusiast option. Yeah, it's funny. I actually rented one of those in Florida where we have an angry fan who probably owns one of these as well. And the reason why he's <laughs> angry is because even in Florida, which is pretty much sea level, it would not get out of its own way. Uh, yeah, but it's, it's an okay car, but it really should just have a, like a plain wrapped label on the side of it that says car. Well, I want to talk about something which I think is so funny. So... Um, there's this guy that, that Nathan's had some interactions with um, who is, like, the biggest Chrysler 200 fan. Oh, I forgot about that guy. Remember yeah. this guy? Oh, man, he was ticked. Yeah, he was a Chrysler 200 fan. Well, he owned one. And we did uh, our early video. Uh, Roman and I went out to the introduction of the car. We went back east and drove it around. And I liked the, um, the V6 version. It, was, it had really good power. But Roman and I are like, the backseat is the worst one ever made. Not only did we feel that way, but the actual um, president or the head CEO of um, uh, FCA at the time said that the backseat was the worst he's ever seen, and he regretted it. This is one of the issues with it. Also, quality wasn't great. Uh, reliability was poor. And so we said these things. And boy, oh boy, this guy in every other broadcast for a while was just like, but you never said that about the Chrysler 200. And I'm like, bro, it's not great. Well, and what you got to understand is like when that car was new, it, it offered some pretty cool um, technology. So all-wheel drive, too. All-wheel drive, yeah. yeah. You, and like insane power for that class with that the, the V6 engine. I think it had that nine speed, which was kind of ahead of its time mm -hmm. when it launched. But looking back at it as the car aged, especially, and people started having some issues with them, and then we really got to see its true colors come out, then yeah, we changed our tune a little bit on the Chrysler 200. And looking back, I think it was a fast car in a straight line. All-wheel drive was cool. Yeah. 200S was kind of funnish, um, but it was not not a great... Well, there's a good reason for Chrysler dropping it from their lineup. It was better than the Sebring. It was better than the Sebring, but that's not really saying much, is it? I mean, that's the, <laughs> yeah. You know, so just certain, you know, chlamydia is a little bit better than, you know, some horrible, deathly disease. <laughs> but um, you, you, in general, uh, that was another vehicle that was very good for rental car fleets, but really not good for certain consumers. And certain people fall in love with their vehicle and want to be proved, proven right about what they bought. And so if we go against that grain, then they're going to fight us. And I totally get that. Uh, I would fight you guys based on, you know, Musical choices, which some of you have terrible musical choices. You listen to what Roman listens to. Well, yeah, because Barry Manilow. Manilow is, I under, can only handle. Underrated, underrated artist. Underrated, apparently. Yeah, underrated. yeah, he rocks. Um, okay, so let's go on to the next one, which is the Mercedes-Benz C-Class, and that's at 46% would buy again. Yeah, super interesting to me. Um, now, C-Class was recently just, like, completely overhauled. Yeah. Um, and I'm not quite sure what data these folks are pulling from. Like, is it the previous one? Is it the new one? I think it's the previous one. I don't know. So the, yeah. the new one is really good. Like, I really like driving it. Um, it. And I don't say that in the Chrysler 200 kind of way. Like, it was a genuinely, it's a fun car. It, it offers a really great driving experience, some great new uh, technology, right? Some, some electrification options there. So I, I do like the Sequest. Sequest. <laughs> There's a widow wabbit. Um, uh, we're hunting wabbits. No, the C-Class is, uh, is a good car. So yeah. kind of interesting that that's on the list. Now, if you want to see the full data, head over to ConsumerReports.com. You can, you know, if you're a member, you can see the predicted reliability, owner satisfaction, all of that sure. as well. Um, now, next on the list at 
Kia Seltos. Okay, now once again, we're back at Kia, um, and yeah, we have another Kia on this list later. Uh, now the Seltos, I'm gonna fight for this one, and I think you might agree with me here because you drove the improved version of it. Improved how? Transmission. Yeah. The old dual clutch was not great. Um, I think Hyundai Kia have had some real problems with setting up their dual clutch transmissions, which they all usually connect to, or all, always connect to their turbocharged engines. Now the Seltos does have a turbocharged engine. I, is that an option? Do they have like a Yeah, base they model? have a base one in the turbo. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the turbo was a dual clutch. I think it was a seven speed before. And they replaced that with an automatic transmission. And whammo bammo, all is forgiven. Way better driving vehicle, much smoother. Uh, almost everything has improved with it, including off-road capability. One of the things about the Seltos is it actually has a decent all-wheel drive system. 50% uh, of the torque can go back to the rear wheels. It has this center. It's not a locker. It's really like a clutch. Uh, yeah. um, but you are able to make 50% 50% you know, torque going front and rear at slow speeds, all that type of stuff. And now you won't overheat your transmission with this automatic transmission doing the same type of obstacles we've already done before and we've had mixed results. Well, look, I think that the Seltos um, with the dual clutch, even if you're never gonna take it in the dirt, which is pretty typical for a Seltos owner, like even in the city, it was a little herky-jerky, Yes. right? A little hard to maneuver, uh, just not a super refined experience. And, you know, they've gone now torque converter automatic. Uh, you got the available 195 horsepower uh, turbo engine, um, you know, just under 200 horsepower. So uh, I, I would agree with you, Nathan. I think from the Seltos as I've driven, even the older ones, they're, they're, they're pretty good. I like the packaging. I yeah, they're a kind of little size. box, right? Yeah. All-wheel drive. Would you get the Seltos or the Kona? That's a good question. So I think the Seltos has a slightly different seating position. It's a little bit higher than the Kona. Um, roof uh, is a little bit on the taller side, too. And I would probably move over to that one physically because I'm an old fat man. Um, but the Kona, the new Kona, I haven't sat in yet, by the way, the brand new one. Yeah, it's good. Um, they did a really good job Yeah, with that's it. what I hear. So yeah. I, I, I have to sample that, but at least with the previous generation, I'd probably move towards the Seltos. Okay, so coming up on the next spot on our list, 44% would buy again. It's another Nissan, Nathan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is the Nissan Kicks. Now, this is a vehicle both you and I have intimate relationships <laughs> with. Yes. You went to the, uh, the actual kickoff event here in the States. I did. Drove it. You didn't seem to hate it. Um, it's okay. And then I had one for over a week when I was in Southern California and doing my family vacation thing. So we went to Disneyland, to the beach and all over the place. And I put like 300 or 400 miles on the car in a very short amount of time. Um, and so I, I want to hear your opinion on it because I, yeah. I'm curious. Well, so um, uh, kind of been recently refreshed a little bit, right? Yeah, a little. Um, so one thing I'm noticing on this list, Nathan, the trend is like super, super in, in quotation marks, but relative to the car market today, more affordable cars. Exactly. Right? So people seem to be relatively unsatisfied with these more affordable cars. And the Kicks S starts at $21,000. Which is a pretty good price considering it's only a little bit more than their, own, their lower model, which is the um, Versa. Yes. Yeah, the Versa is their entry level car, and this is just a step above that. Now, from a driving experience, it's pretty dreary. Yeah. Small, naturally aspirated four cylinder engine, quite slow, um, and CVT, of course, Front wheel drive only. Um, but look, this car kind of, it was one of the early like ultra subcompact crossovers that kicked off like the front wheel drive only thing. So like- Here in the States. Yeah, here in the, yeah, States. Here in the States. So Kicks launched um, and it was okay. I kind of sort of liked it because it offered some pretty good technology for the price. Agreed. Then the venue launched. Um, and you don't like the venue very much. I just think it's terribly slow. I love the venue. I think it's a really cool piece of packaging. And I always felt like the venue was just a little better than the Kicks. And then, the Trax launched, the new Chevy Trax. Trax absolutely trounces both of those in every conceivable way. Right. And pricing isn't that much different. Right. So the Trax absolutely murders them. But here's the thing about that. Uh, let's go back to the actual um, Nissan Kicks. And I can tell you a couple things. First of all, uh, the ride height, I think, is quite good, especially for early drivers. Yeah, uh, I agree. Very easy to maneuver and park. Very easy. Great first car in that respect. Yep. Um, Stupidly slow. If you load it with four human beings and their cargo, like I did with my family. <laughs> it's very slow. Um, oh my God. I was, you know, Prius were like rocketing past me first <laughs> and second gen, just making me look like I was a snail. 
uh, it's almost dangerous how slow cars like that can be. Um, and you're murdering the engine just to keep up with traffic until you get up to a certain speed. Right. So that's the negative. The positive is decent mileage. Yeah, um, it's okay. Uh, the one I had was the top of the line, which I think is the SV, but I'm not 100% I think sure. It's SR. It's, okay. And it had the speakers in the seats for the driver. Yeah, that's cool. Which was cool because I was able to groove, and then my family had to hear the crappier tinny sound, mm -hmm. but I could hear the good stuff in my, you know, when I was driving. So that was good, but I would agree. I think that the, um, the Hyundai probably gives you a little bit more for the money. I would agree, yeah. But once again, with the Chevy Trax out there, that vehicle is far superior in terms of performance, size, size comfort, ride, handling, and I believe it's about as efficient as those, in addition to the fact that you get a lot of tech for the money. So yeah, basically it's a no brainer. Yeah, I mean, and Hyundai starts like a thousand bucks cheaper, right? If you really focus on cost, yeah. the Nissan is 114 pound feet of torque. So that's where, the, that's where some of the- Just dreadful. But yeah. what, and, and that's at Cal, in California, by the way, which is at close sea to the level, sea level up right. here. Oh, yeah. yeah, so look, I think it's not necessarily a bad car, front wheel drive only, but ever since we saw the tracks revealed, it's just, it can't compete. Yeah, yeah, it really can. So next on the list, Nathan, <laughs> We're back to a Kia. Yep. Um, it's, uh, it's a Sorento Hybrid, which I think is an interesting kind of point that they point out it's a Sorento Hybrid. 42% would buy again. That's a poor number. Uh, now, we've had the, a Sorento Hybrid. I believe that is all-wheel drive. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. Which is, in this class, a little bit of a rarity. Like, if you look at the Ford Escape plug-in hybrid. Mm -hmm. Oh, this is just the regular hybrid, too. Never mind. It's a standard hybrid. Yeah, yeah. standard hybrid. Um, so, yeah, it is definitely all-wheel drive. But uh, in addition, there are other competitors out there. Um, I'd say the one thing about the Sorento hybrid that puts it in a decent category is the fact that it's not that expensive to walk into and it's competitive with the Honda CRV uh, hybrid. But I think that maybe the CRV has slightly better packaging and definitely better reliability. Well, look, so they just put a new kind of nose on, on the Sorento. Yeah. They just kind of up, upgraded a little bit. So I'm, I'm excited to see kind of what some of the, the changes are in the, in the, the new model year. Um, Nothing announced with powertrain. Yeah, I think this might be perhaps a little bigger than the CRV because uh, you do get the third row right option which is cool so you, you can carry some more it's people but very it's, it's small. very small right if you want to haul more like a pilot is going to do do that yeah, a lot better that's closer in size to the mitsubishi um uh, outlander phev in terms of its third row well and what i don't understand about the sorento right is you got the telluride and now the ev9 yep um yeah it's kind of a weird size of sorento yeah uh, so, yeah, I, I understand why it's on the list, perhaps. Um, I mean, it's interesting, Nathan, that there's no Hondas or Toyotas on this list. What do you think of that? Uh, well, that, that says a lot in terms of, you know, customer satisfaction. And perhaps there's a good reason for that. But I don't see any Fords on this list or Chevrolets or Dodge. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I, mean, I know. It's a good point. Actually, I don't think I see any American automobiles on this nope, list. No Chevys, no Fords. Mm, nothing. So, and also no Minis. <laughs> no minis, no Fiats. No BMWs. By the way, I just read something interesting. Did you know that Fiat sold less than 700 cars in 2023? Well, look at what they had to sell. They the have Fiat, one they had car. The 500X, and that's it. Thank God they got rid of the 500L. So the 500X, uh, not, uh, not brilliant. It's oh, okay. Here we go. Uh. 605. I mean, well, how do you maintain so you know, a dealer network with 605 <laughs> vehicles sold? I think that what they've done, just like everything else, so real quick, Stellantis, uh, with all of their failing, when they took over, or when they combined, uh, they gave a chunky budget to Dodge, Chrysler, Fiat, Alfa Romeo, Lancia, and a few other things that are under their umbrella that are losing with sales. And they basically said, you have X amount of time to make a profit. If you do not, you're done. And I believe that was a five-year thing that they put them on. Uh, we have a story of that on, uh, at TFL Car. And because of that, that's allowed Fiat to survive here in the States. They've had one car. Now, in the near future, they're about to have Two cars, because they're about to get the 500E, which I'm hearing decent things about. Right. It's supposed to be a pretty fun car to drive, competitive. But, dude, something's got to change. Yeah. I mean, less than two cars sold on average a day, <laughs> it's just not going yeah, to be sustainable. They pop a, uh, you know, a cork from the champagne every time they sell one car. I mean, uh, you know, can you imagine that? But you know, they, they, it, they have never had a good 
presence in the United States. I think that the original 500 and the 500 Abarth were their best offerings. And they were cool, right? They were that cool. Big, that uh, was a big push. Actually, their most reliable car was the regular 500, not even the turbo, it's the regular 500, mm. but it was small and not very useful for people. Anyway, uh, not on this list though. Not on this list. Not why? This list. Because there's just not enough of them to count. <laughs> that must be the reason why. No, uh, or people love them. Maybe people love their Maybe people Texas. love them. So next on the list, Nathan, back to Nissan. Yeah. Um, it's a Sentra. 39% would buy a Nissan Sentra again. There used to be a time when the N Nissan Sentra really was the proper competition against the Toyota Corolla. Like, remember like when they had the SER? Oh, yeah, the original. The original, the mm -hmm. squared off SER. That thing was so cool. And, yeah, by today's standards, it's not very fast, but they handled great, and they were just great little cars, and you only spent like $1,000 over what you would spend on a regular one to have a really good handling fun car. I remember them dearly, and then progressively they just were washed out. Now, Nissan Sentras, there are a couple different versions of them out there. I think they still sell the Nismo. Um, oh, and, oh, I don't know about that. Yeah, it, they may, and it's... Mm, it, it, the good news is that the Sentra is a decent riding car. It handles quite well. It I does, think. yeah. Um, and it has good back seat room. And right. That's about it. There's really not a lot to, to tickle your fancy and make you fall in love with it. It doesn't have what I would call a good personality. It's you know so, what I mean? It's got pretty good standard safety tech, yeah. like Safety Shield 360. Which is standard throughout every Nissan product, by yeah, the way. Yeah, right. Um, 20,630 starting, so standard safety shield, remote keyless entry, Apple CarPlay, right? So, yeah, I mean, there's some like good tech in it. I agree that it is probably a better riding car than the Corolla. Yep, I would I, agree. I think it's it's a little bit more comfy. Um, but then, like, look, you, you look at what Toyota is offering with, with Corolla, or maybe even Honda with a Civic, right? So, like, Corolla now you can get in front-wheel drive, front-wheel drive hybrid, all-wheel drive hybrid. And the Nissan Sentry, you get one engine choice, CVT transmission, front-wheel drive only. So they don't have some of the, the same value-added features that... Toyota has. And I think that those two, and then of course the Civic, I think the Civic is far superior than the uh, Sentra. In fact, I would be curious, and it would be great if they did a follow-up to this to see where the Conquest sales are going with some of these cars. Yeah, you know, I agree. What are they going to buy in lieu of this car? I would be curious. So next up on my list, Nathan, this <laughs> is... You dislike this one thoroughly, I, I, to I, be fair. There are very few cars that I actively dislike. So we get this question a lot, like, you know, what are, what's like a bad car you can buy today? Um, and there really isn't a bad, like in the 80s, a Chevette was a pretty bad car. Sure. You know, or a Citation, right? There were like genuinely bad cars that had major engineering flaws, reliability flaws. Today, like any car is going to last you over the period of its warranty. It's going to be pretty safe. It's going to be pretty fuel efficient. But this is one of my least favorite cars on sale. I'll explain why. So it's the Volkswagen Taos, T-A-O-S. It's the small Volkswagen crossover. Yes, named after a small town in New Mexico. Now, um, here's why I dislike the Taos. So, the one we tested had um, the turbo engine yeah. and the dual clutch transmission. Yeah. And I have never felt a powertrain that was in perpetual battle with itself. So Very herky-jerky. You would get like a slip from the dual clutch transmission when you start off from a stop. So you get a little jerk and then you hit the accelerator and nothing would happen because they wouldn't get power from that turbo. And then the turbo would hit and you go shooting back in the seat. So it was one of the few cars that I've genuinely had a hard time driving smoothly. It's a difficult car in my experience. And granted, maybe this one has something wrong with it, but the seven speed DSG combined with the turbo was such a poor combo. They need to get rid of the DSG and put in a regular Automatic transmission. Like what Kia did. Exactly. Yep. Now, I drove that car at its launch event. I thought it handled decent for, sure. for a small car. And I like the fact that it had turbo power. But even with the, the roads that, you know, when they do these press events, they take you on roads that they know will favor the vehicle. And so I was on these great roads going through Malibu and everything else, and everything was great and hunky-dory. Then I hit traffic. And in the traffic, <laughs> it was just... It was just such an unhappy car. And I did say that on my review, yeah. but it was, it's utilitarian, it's relatively affordable, it's relatively economical, so Volkswagen <laughs> fans might like that, but for the most part, 
not one of their best offerings. But you like we say turbo power. It's 158 horsepower. I know. It's not a well, lot. It's not a lot of power. I mean, the Celtos we were just talking about has available 195, and right? And they're about the same size. Yeah, and they're about the same size. So it's just, it's really not a winner for me. Yeah. Um, especially, like, because this car kind of spiritually replaced the Golf in the U.S. Yeah. You know, the standard, not the GTI, like the standard Golf. Um, and the Mark 7 Golf, the standard one, was such an engaging, high-quality car. It was such a nice thing to experience and to live with. And the Taos just didn't live up to that. I would agree with you there, too. Yeah. Um, I mean, I will say, Nathan, to your point, right, like, 4Motion, all-wheel drive is pretty good. Yep. Yeah. Um, you've got some pretty decent technology. You got some okay technology in it, um, you know, pretty decent warranty. So look, there's not, it's not all bad. I like some of the colors, I'll say that, but it's just not a, not, not a winner in my book. I wouldn't even call it a proper ski vehicle. And that's because of that transmission. I do not like something that lurches and then suddenly you're getting the, all the power from the turbo because that actually makes it difficult in slippery conditions. So that needs to be addressed in addition to the fact that that transmission probably should be replaced. All right, Nathan, the number one, the least satisfying car role play, role play. Role play. Role play, please. <laughs> Well, at least, at least it's not an enema that you're talking about. Oh, Anything man, else. Nathan, how was your enema? Oh, you were an en enigma. That's was what it an was. enigma, yeah. That's suppository, right. apparently. Um, tell me now, you already talked about that last broadcast. So, <laughs> <laughs> drum roll, the Infiniti QX50. Only 25% would buy again, and I say for damn good reason. Well, okay, what's the reason, Nathan? Powertrain, baby. Such an unusual, you know, we were just talking about the Volkswagen, how the turbocharged engine and the transmission just do not pair up well. This is another excellent example of a vehicle that I think looks fantastic. It's a very pretty vehicle. The interior is pretty as well. I think it's actually rather striking, but it has a turbocharged, high tech turbocharged four cylinder engine, which is both economical and powerful. It is a marvel that Nissan spent billions on developing. But then they paired it to a continuously variable transmission. Yes, I know some of you guys are like, they're not all that bad. Well, guess what? When you have a luxury vehicle like this that looks like it's a performer and it's paired to that transmission, it sucks out all the joy from that powertrain and it makes it loud and uncomfortable. This yeah. is a vehicle that I truly believe Infinity Botched. They need to get rid of that transmission. They got a nine speech, throw it in there, right. find a replacement because otherwise it's a great car. Look, here's the thing. I think it's an attractive car. Yeah. Um, but uh, you talk about that the turbo, right? The VC turbo, very com variable compression, like really good technology in this vehicle. But it's in such a competitive class, like that small premium crossover. You've got like Mercedes GLC, BMW X3, Genesis G70. Genesis, thank you. Right. Which, which out and most of these vehicles do outperform it. However, I maintain that if you actually got rid of that transmission and put something else there. The cool thing about having you know, variable compression is that you can be at high compression or low compression. It actually can change. And that means that you can be pumping through a lot of horsepower when you need it, or you can actually have it blowing at a much more efficient rate, and you no longer have to use that much gas in order to make it go forward. Hence, it, it actually it gets really decent mileage. Right but it needs a different transmission or they need to seriously update that CVT. In addition to the fact that the exhaust stone on the thing might be the worst in class. It sounds like it's pretty an droney. old yeah. mercury thing that you shoved in the water and just had heard it go. <laughs> it is <laughs> so terrible to hear. And I'm sorry because I hate to kick Infinity while they're down because their sales are not particularly great, but this QX50 and its brother, the 55, poor powertrain, beautiful to look at. Yeah, great design. Yeah. Um, the seats are really cool. Like you can get like this quilted, stitched leather. Yes, it looks great. Um, it's actually taking a page out of Genesis, which is taking a page out of higher-end European vehicles. Yeah, and then the other thing which I'm gonna have to ding it on is like it's got this dual screen thing. Oh yeah, it's, it's, some people don't like it's that. Just not needed. It's just not needed, and it's looking very like 2012 now. Yeah, it's a bit dated. I agree with that. So too. look, I agree. I mean, Infinity, Infinity's in kind of a tough spot. Um, I, I think that the QX50, uh, sorry, QX60 mm. is okay. It's a Pathfinder based one. It's a one. Pathfinder with more power. Well, it's, it's got the same power as the Rock Creek, which has a little bump over the regular Pathfinder. So I think it's a, it's a pretty good driving car. Yeah. Um, I've always liked the QX80, which is the Armada. Yeah. Right? And then the QX50, 
50, sorry, the Q50, the naming thing is horrible too, but yeah, the Q50, the sedan, it's old, but it's a really fun car. Um, but but it's, the, it's like the volume area there, the 50 and the 55, where everybody's competing against the same dollars, unless, the only reason I would buy that over like a GV70 or the Audi offering, or even the Lexus, is it have to get a substantial discount on that Infiniti. Major, major discount, and that's the only way they're gonna be able to move these things, especially when you look at what, you know, how many people are gonna come back and buy another one. That's not particularly good. Now, one final note on uh, Infiniti. Uh, they have announced that they will be moving to all electric platforms in the near future. So they maybe are looking at this like, okay, this is a temporary band-aid, and then we're going to switch to electrification, and as such, this is no longer going to be an issue. That might be the, what they're thinking. They haven't announced anything in that respect, but they did say that they were moving to electrification. Well, we would love to hear your input on the topic. What are some of the best and the least satisfying cars you have owned in your lifetime? But we're moving on, folks. Thank you to Consumer Reports for putting that together. Um, and we are talking about the Consumer Electronics Show. CES happened this uh, week. And we had some big news and some rather small news. And we're going to talk about the small news first. I mean small literally because this is one of the cars that uh, really piqued my attention. So a company called VinFast. Mm -hmm. Nathan's driven them. It's an all-electric brand from Vietnam. That's correct. Um, they showed off a car which... Um, they're thinking about bringing to the States, nothing official yet. It's called the VF3, and what is this little guy? The VF3 is their smallest offering, which is being built overseas, by the way. It is essentially the size, uh, it's not much bigger than this Fiat that's behind Tommy, frankly. It's tiny, it's absolutely tiny. It looks like a small crossover SUV, but in reality, it is a front drive electric vehicle, I believe, its range is around 120 or 130 miles. They're aiming for 125. Yeah, right? uh, but it's mm, it, it's hard to say whether or not they'll be able to keep that, you know, because that's WLTP uh, measurements, and so I'm not sure if that's going to be the same here. Uh, but it's a very utilitarian little thing. It's a box, basically. I think it's great looking, and I think... Americans would love that, and that's what they should have led with, by the way. The VF7 that I tested was not great. Uh, they've made improvements, I hear. And remember, VinFast is breaking ground right now in, I believe, North Carolina with their um, manufacturing um, branch. So they're going to be building VinFast here in the United States, meaning that those cars will be eligible for certain uh, rebates. So I want you to imagine like a Suzuki Jimny, which is this little chunky off-roader abroad, sort of in that same size um, category. Like a Samurai. It's like a little square box, yeah, but a little lifted off the ground. But here's the big news. So um, according to Autoblog, apparently VinFast talked with U.S. dealers about models, and it was suggested the VF3 could be offered for less than $20,000. That's huge news. Now, if they can maintain that, if they can actually bring in a car for under 20 grand, that has over 120 miles range, let's say, they can maintain that. Um, that would be a great way to bring in people who need an electric vehicle that are in urban areas and need something small, easy to charge, and easy to pay for. And I'm willing to bet that if they do build it here in the States, then you also will get certain tax credits. Oh, man. That could really save, I mean, that could be a huge. Uh, Will they do it? Mm, that's a good question. However, VinFest does have a new boss, and uh, apparently things are changing. I'm hoping so because, once again, their initial offering here in the States, the VF7, was not a good first impression. I think, um, was it the 8 you drove? VF8? VF7 or VF8? I VF8. think it's VF8. Sorry, yeah. did I no. say VF7? Yeah, VF7. Oh, sorry, guys. But, so here's the thing, right? So the VF8, which is on sale now, they've sold a, they've sold a good number of them. Um, it's, it's, it's an electric crossover that has some quality issues that Nathan experienced. Yes. But the biggest issue is it just doesn't offer a competitive advantage over like a Model Y or a Blazer EV. Not for the price. Not for the price. But this is why I'm excited about this little teeny box, this VF3, is because it's something new and fresh to the marketplace that no other company's really targeting. Nobody's, I mean, if you're looking at Fiat or, or Mini, those are the two, I think, least expensive uh, EVs that you'll be able to buy in the US. And A, neither of those offer a um, incentive because of the batteries. They're not you know, made here in the United States. Uh, I believe that VinFast did say when I tested the VF8, sorry guys, um, that they would be building and sourcing a lot of their materials right here from the States that should include North American source batteries or whatever qualifies in that uh, list. But the point is, is that 
an inexpensive vehicle like that, that's fun to look at, that's cute and utilitarian, that little boxy shape is very utilitarian. Uh, that could be a huge seller and it could get people into the brand. I highly recommend that they consider building something like that. Couldn't agree more, Nathan. Yep, so that was really exciting for me. Uh, Volkswagen also dropped some news. We got a new 2025 Golf GTI. Uh, it's got some new technology, 15 inch screen, and they dropped the manual transmission. Boo. Boo, I agree. Boo. Yeah. yeah, we knew that was coming though. Actually, I don't know if that's on all TFL anymore, but it's definitely on TFL car. Uh, Zach wrote about that, and it's it's a shame. I think yeah. there's a lot of people out there who still like to ship, but the bottom line is that it's around 4% of the people out there buy manual transmission cars. Yeah, it's pretty tiny, yeah. So we also saw some new um, concepts from companies like Honda oh, yeah. and Kia. Uh, Honda debuted a new logo, which is kind of a retro throwback to what they used to do. Um, these vehicles are so out there, there's not a ton to really get excited about because well, I... You, there, there is one thing. What, what, is, what do you got? Honda is, first of all, Honda has officially basically said, we're not using the Ultium platform after we're done with this prologue, which by the way, we're gonna be driving in the very near future. What they basically did say was, we are doing our own thing. And so this is a taste of what they have in mind with their own EV architecture. All right, so Nathan, we had the package delivered. So um, keep going with the, what, what you thought was cool with Honda. Yeah, so they are introducing their own platform, their own EV architecture, and I think a lot of us out here are, are, are kind of cheering that. Look, nothing against General Motors, but the fact is, is that this is Honda. Honda is one of the most technologically advanced companies in the world. They build jets for crying out loud and robots. Yeah. Why the hell don't they have their own EV architecture that they can use here in the United States? Now, I know some of you are gonna say, well, wait a minute, that Honda E, uh, I think that's what it was called, failed in, in Europe. It didn't really fail, I just didn't sell was, a lot well, of them. Well, it was too expensive and it, it only went like pricey. 100 miles. Yeah, yeah, it didn't have the range. But packaging, people raved about, and performance, handling at least, people said it was quite good. So I think for first step, they did pretty well. Most importantly though, the stuff that they're showing at CES looks really cool, very Blade Runner-like, yeah. which I dig. Uh, Blade Runner was a movie with Harrison Ford. Yeah, yeah, okay. I got it, oh, I got so it. So anyway, um, <laughs> This is something that I think we can really look forward to. This is something that I think will be competitive because I know that Honda doesn't do half steps. If they're announcing that they're going to be doing an electric vehicle with their own architecture and they're showing these things to tease us, I think that's something to look forward to. So we also had some news from Kia with the uh, PV line of vehicles, these yeah. kind of um, really square utilitarian vans, kind of the hauler machines, very futuristic. Yes, but there's a good point to this. Okay. See, they also announced in the past, they would be building a small electric or an electric pickup truck, which we assume is going to be small. Mm. Maybe the, one of those platforms may underpin it. Right, and it's kind of like a cab over design, similar to what like Canoe has been showing off. Yeah. So um, we got some stuff on that. And then Honda also showed off another vehicle that, they, that they've, they've shown in the past, but it's looking more production ready. It's a combination of Honda and Sony's called the Afila. Yeah. Which is a terrible name. It's a um, terrible name, but I think it's a cool looking vehicle. It is a cool looking vehicle. It's got like a little like LCD screen on the nose that can like play images and stuff. So it's, 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 it's definitely trippy. I don't think you're going to see that very often. Imagine people driving along and all of a sudden you're staring at another car as you're passing it by because the LCD screen's doing something. <laughs> Not the best idea. Actually, in China, they have a couple vehicles that will have a displays, LCD displays that'll change oh, yeah? on the back of the vehicle. Interesting. But uh, I think that that might not be something that'll uh, catch on here. But there's more with uh, Honda Kia, Hyundai Kia, sorry. What you got? Um, so Hyundai also debuted a vehicle which is uh, co-built by Mobius, which will allow you to turn all four wheels oh, yes. 180 degrees, up to 180 degrees, so you can slide the car right into a parking spot, showing, I think, one of the other benefits of having uh, an electrification uh, powertrain, uh, electrified powertrain, sorry, um, because it'd be really hard to do that with a gas vehicle, having an axle and all that other stuff, but in a vehicle like this, where you can separate things and have them electrically connected, so to speak, it is easier to do that. As such, imagine being able to go to a parking spot that was really tight and sliding right in and having the car slide itself right out. Yeah, it's not the first time we've seen stuff no, like no, this, but it, it is cool. Yeah, it's called the Hyundai Mobion Concept, and yeah, it kind of debuts this new 
technology of being able to turn all four wheels individually to be um, perpendicular to where they typically are. Uh, kind of a fun idea, Nathan. Um, whether They've been or not, playing with this for a while. A though. long time. Yeah. Do you think we'll ever realistically see I something like so. this? I think so. I think this is going to be, look, they've been surprising us in the past with vehicles we did not expect them to build. And I think that this might be tech. And remember, they got together with uh, what's it, Boston Electronics and a bunch of other companies in the past with robotics and all these other things. They're serious about staying ahead of the curve when it comes to uh, electrification and utilizing it in different ways. And then a little bit of additional news, Nathan, and um, I know it's not the truck podcast, but it does fit in the CES. That same company we were mentioning, VinFast, earlier revealed a trunk, a trunk, a truck concept called the VinFast Wild Pickup. You know, I believe that the Wild Pickup is based on the platform that's used with the VF9, which is about to come out. The VF9 is their competitor to the large Kia, what the is EV9. that? EV9. Yeah, yeah, EV9. Uh, so that big uh, uh, VinFast three-row SUV platform, I believe, underpins this as well. Now, one thing I heard from a little bird is that VinFast is quite serious about this thing based on how people react because they are looking at competing in what will be eventually a market for electric pickup trucks. Yeah, right. I mean, it's kind of a futuristic looking design, a little Blade Runner with the wheels, but it doesn't look that crazy from right. a production standpoint. It's got a mid gate that drops down, really cool interior, some organic finishes. Um, look, I, as much heck as VinFast has gotten by US press, and a lot of it deservedly so, I still have a lot of respect that they were able to bring a car to the market. Yep. I mean, the number of time, hours, and millions of dollars it takes to get a car certified for sale in the US is so astronomical that, you know, 99% of companies fail well before they even build a prototype. I, I agree 100%. But VinFast did it. They yes, did they it. did. Yeah. And then if you look at all of those companies where you're seeing a lot of vaporware, where, you know, especially in Silicon Valley or those areas where people are like, oh, yes, we're going to introduce this really cool Alpha Wolf pup, you know, pickup truck. It's going to come I know. anytime yeah. now. And they look really cool, but they don't actually build them. They're just trying to you know, accumulate money. Um, I don't think that uh, a company like VinFast deserves the scorn of everybody for trying to build a vehicle for our market. And the good news is, is that they're already looking at upgrading and updating their vehicles to make them more competitive. What they need to do, I think, is they need to undercut everybody in terms of pricing. It's the only way you're going to get people into the door mm -hmm. because there's no reason why I would want a VF8 over a Mustang Mach-E. There's just no reason. Yet, if they priced a couple thousand dollars underneath that equivalent Mustang Mach-E, then I would consider it, you know, as a consumer. Yeah. So, folks, we'd love to hear your input on some other cool stuff going on at CES. We didn't make it this year because there just wasn't enough concrete news, we thought, from the automotive world. Yeah, it's actually kind of a shame. I really wish we did go, but we'll, go, we'll try to go next year. We'll make it next year. Yeah, we got a lot going on around the offices, these parts. Um, and Nathan, before we wrap up here, I do want to toss to a clip um, that I recently shot. So, um, I, we have a Land Rover Defender on loan right now, mm -hmm. and we wanted to compare the Defender to a vehicle that has been highly anticipated. It's the Ineos Grenadier. Now, this is a new company from the UK that just started selling cars last year here in the US, and it's an old school, body on frame, solid axle vehicle that has its design roots in the original Defender. Yeah, th I, I like to think of it as a mixture of the old Defender and a mixture of the old uh, Isuzu Trooper 2. Uh, trooper 2. Yeah. What a specific piece of trivia well, actually, that is. Any, any trooper, really. <laughs> it, well, the back doors, the way the back doors are designed right. and, and some of the boxy design. But it, it's a uh, BMW powertrain, uh, solid axles, uh, very capable off road. We've already seen that. We've actually had an opportunity to see these vehicles do certain things. Right. But now we're one of the few who's been able to get what is the modern interpretation of that vehicle, and then this one, which is really an anachronistic vehicle, and compete with them, right? Yeah, so um, I had him side by side, and I shot this video with the owner. He was the first delivery here in Colorado, so he's had it longer than just about anybody um, in the state, at least, right? So uh, I wanted to get his experience of what it was like to buy and own it and live with it. So it was my first drive on road in the Grenadier. Now keep in mind, um, uh, this is actually, clips of this were used in a car video that should be coming up slash have gone up, but it was a long, interesting kind of rant that we did, and I thought it'd be worth just running the whole thing. So um, we're gonna put that clip in here now, and you can learn a little bit about the Grenadier and what it's like in my first drive. All right, folks, so I'm here with Mark. Mark, thanks for having me come no by. No problem. I really appreciate it. And um, 
This is the first Grenadier in Colorado. That's correct. Yeah, That's first really one. cool. So tell me about your process on buying this vehicle. Um, you know, when did you submit your interest and, and how long has the process been? So when I uh, when I got home from picking this car or picking up the Grenadier, I went and I just searched my Gmail. I searched Grenadier just to see like when the very first instance of any uh, talk about it or any communication. And I originally put in my request for more info from them in September of 2020. Wow. Yeah, it's uh, it's been a long time. And when did you take delivery? I took delivery on the Saturday after Thanksgiving. Okay, so, so you made it under the 2024 kind of start yep, there. Yeah, and really before cool. December too. So I know a lot of people are saying end of December was when they were hoping for it. I got mine in November. So. And what did you come out of to, to purchase this vehicle? What were you in before? So I was in a holdover uh, 2011 FJ Cruiser. Okay. Yep, and it was something that I had bought um knowing you know it was it was a holdover i just wanted something that was a little more reliable than my jeep and i wanted something that was uh obviously capable for colorado trails and off-roading what we do here right can we turn that fan down yep. you might know it'd be perfect oh. so mark you've had um quite a bit of seat time in this how many miles are you up to uh just under uh, 1600 on this right now like 1500 and 50 or so. And before I give some of my impressions, because you live with this car, mm -hmm. what, are, what are your driving impressions? What do you think of it on the road? I love it on the road. The, the seating position is so awesome. You sit so high. Even a full-size truck where you're next to it uh, at a light, you're looking, it seems like you're looking down at them. And the jump down is already, you know, even getting out, people in, in the stock form, people have a hard time almost getting into this thing because it's tall. It's a tall seating position. But I'm also six foot five and I'm tall to begin with. So it's nice for me to have the uh, the position, uh, the headspace, you know, the the room in here, it just feels really nice to drive. Yeah, I mean, and I can tell you right off the bat, right, it's a it's a pretty different driving experience than, for example, like that new Defender. Um, the steering is is very Wrangler like. Yep. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. I mean, you got solid axle, so it's a very yep. slow steering box. Yep. But it's not scary. No. You know, it's not not that vague. It's not, not that no. wandering. Um, what do you think of the turning circle? I know that's been a big complaint for a lot of folks. <laughs> the turning circle is something that is going to be uh, interesting uh, to get when we get on tighter trails and that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, it's 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 pretty bad. Yeah. Um, however, you know, it's not the end of the world. You got to maybe do a two point turn to get into a parking spot if you're you know you know around town. Um, but the one thing I will, the one thing that I'm most looking forward to taking this on to see how how, how it is is going to be black bear pass on the switchbacks okay because what, what, which got you excited about that well just because of the turning radius i know it's going to be <laughs> it's going to be a big workout i'll make sure to to to, uh, to stretch before that yeah make sure of, you don't do any arm days before yeah, exactly, that day yeah exactly now, um so yeah i think that you know the turning radius is definitely something that a lot of people are noticing and it you know there's really no way of hiding it it's it's definitely uh you know it's it's a big turning radius for sure it's pretty it's pretty long now one thing i've noticed right off the bat which is a little interesting is the ride's a little firmer than i was kind of expecting mm -hmm. um and uh you know i think a lot of that is due to the fact you have coil springs and solid axles and you mm -hmm. don't want to have that much body roll right um and i think one thing that maybe grenadier should look into or any should look into going forward is like a disconnectable front sway bar absolutely i think that would be a really yep. really big plus yep and you know during the whole process of uh you know of them coming out with more details and stuff before the release there was a lot of these q a sessions you know send us your questions you know what questions you have for the engineers and that was actually a question i sent in was is there going to be any sort of a, a, a you know sway bar disconnect just because i got so used to it with my jeep yeah right you know it's like oh it's so nice and um you know unfortunately not yet but like i said the the aftermarket is just waiting for these you know there's there's so many different products that are already coming out um, but now that they're starting to be on the road and everything in, in America and people are be able to get their hands on them, I think the aftermarket is really going to step up and they'll, they'll definitely be a disconnect, a sway bar disconnect solution of some sort, I'm, I'm, I'm sure of in the future. So let's talk about quality for a second, mm -hmm. because look, someone cross shopping this vehicle might be cross shopping with a Defender. They might be cross shopping with like a fully loaded Wrangler 392 or, you know, Bronco Raptor um, or even like a Mercedes G on the upper end. Mm -hmm. um, and this is an unknown brand for yep. everybody in the States. Um, what has your quality experience been like? Have you had any issues? You want to talk a little bit about that? Um, so as far as like, you know, internal, internally switches, you know, steering wheel, pedals, everything, all that, that's all been fine. I haven't really had any issues. 
there's been a few little things um you know one time i turned the key or i turned the gas turned the car on and it told me that my key battery was low hmm. and this was two weeks three weeks after i got it i'm like well that's kind of weird so i turned it off turned it back on it was fine cleared it okay. cleared it um you know little things like some a couple times my tire pressure sensors came on um you know and then after a mile or two they turn back off again you know it's just kind of like weird little software things little software um bugs i'm sure that will get fixed with updates um you know as time progresses but other than that like there hasn't been any major there's been no no major mechanical issues i haven't had anything fail on me there's you know um some uh you know with those safari windows you know there's maybe a little bit of wind noise but i mean once you hit 80 85 what isn't doesn't have wind noise right you know what i mean like what do you expect so and especially driving around in a box um but uh yeah other than those few things with the you know with the um, the tpms and the and the key battery kind of thing it's been it's been fine one thing I, I'm like initially impressed with is just the complete lack of squeaks and rattles. Yeah. You know, when you, you think of a new brand, right, and, and some of the troubles that brands like Tesla had had when they first launched in the U.S. with quality, and you compare it to this, I mean, it is like a bank vault in here. Yeah. It's so quiet. So solid, and just shutting the doors. I mean, we slammed the hood up there. Yes, right. It's just the lo the best clunk you've ever heard, uh, aside from maybe a G-Wagon. Yeah, pretty close. Aside from maybe a G, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so let's talk about this engine for a little bit. Now, sure. three liter inline six from BMW. Mm -hmm. It's been one of the hottest points from folks online mm -hmm. um, because folks, you know, want to see an LS or something from Toyota. Oh, yeah. What's your take on that? Um, BMW is great. I mean, I, I've been a BMW, I've had BMWs in the past. Um, I know the power that they that they can make and i'm sure this thing is is obviously down tuned from ineos sure um but there's so much torque there's power off the line coming out of a, an fj which is just <laughs> anemic yeah. uh, i mean some of the trails that we would do is just like you know obviously it was fine it worked um but it's just you know you get into higher elevations too and you're you know with a without a turbo or any forced induction in elevation you're you know you're starting to work those engines pretty good and this thing so far has been great the torque off the line you know i will not say it's fast it's definitely not fast but it's peppy off the line and that's something that until i re-geared my jeep i never had that kind of pep off the line right um, yeah you know and then you know comparing to you know to a six cylinder in the in the um in the, in the jeep and the fj just miles more torque and that's one thing that i just love so much, so much it feels so good taking off and it just it's there right away there's not it, there's not the you know turbo lag or anything like that and it's like you said before too the bmw this engine is in everything it's in so many different so many of their cars and you know why would you put a non-tried and true oh yeah uh, engine right in the you know to into a brand new like they don't want to have it fail right off the bat you know it's like i'm sure there's plenty of research and development before they chose this specific motor for this thing. Mark, what I'm really um, interested in, and, and I've driven this engine in a lot of applications, but um, there really seems to be, as you mentioned, like a complete lack of, of lag, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, and when people think turbos, they probably think of like 1980s turbos, mm -hmm. where you have to wait till 4,000 RPM, which is not what you want on a four-wheel drive. Right. But this engine, at least at slow speeds, feels super responsive, mm -hmm. even at lower RPMs. Yep, that's exactly. Yeah, it's really, really cool. Um, the other thing I'm noticing too is is the windows are huge mm -hmm. so you get really good visibility maybe not so much out the back because you got kind of that pillar in the middle yeah the back is but you know what tell give me one suv or one off-roading vehicle with a tire on the back that you can't that you're gonna see out the back very <laughs> just, well you know you just yeah. kind of that's true no no I'm, i mean I, I from a driving standpoint i like like I kind of was expecting the steering is very numb and a little uh -huh. slow but yep. the the throttle response is excellent you get a little bit more engine feedback a little bit more noise from the engine yep. than maybe a BMW because lack of sound doesn't it? exactly but eight-speed transmission is yep. also very proven ZF mm -hmm. now what about the tech so one of the things that's been a hot button issue I talked to Adam in a previous video I'd love yep. to get your impression yep. is the ADAS functionality <laughs> and this speed warning that alerts you every time you go over 30 what's been your impression yep. on that so when I got in my vehicle when I got in this thing the very first day I had it I started coming home from the dealer and I'm like what is all this racket like what is this noise and like I'm trying to figure out 
you know where it's coming from what like it's just you know the speed limit sign is flashing the lights on the screen like what is this stuff so yeah after digging around through these settings there's this it, what it does is it senses the the speed uh, you know this it reads this, uh, the speed limit signs and then puts them on the screen and if you're going over over that speed limit then it it blinks and it sounds like a really loud blinker and you can't really i mean you can adjust it but it doesn't seem to do much so yeah, every single time I get in, I've got a favorite button here stored. So I hit that favorite button and immediately go and turn just that off. I mean, everything else, the lane key, the, the lane drift or whatever they call it, yeah. that, that works okay. And it's not nearly as invasive uh, and loud. Um, it's definitely- It's just a speed limit thing. It's just a speed limit on. thing that's annoying, yeah. yeah. And what about um, uh, like the rest of the tech? I mean. Apple CarPlay, mm -hmm. the, the infotainment, you've been yep, pretty happy with that. All works great. Yeah. Looking forward to using um, you know, Onyx Off-Road um, on the CarPlay, uh, just because in the past I've always had an iPad mounted somewhere, and with this, you don't really need to anymore. Um, you know, because it's all, I used to you know, have just a phone mount and then an iPad next to it along with you know, whatever stereo I had in my other cars, but to have that all just right here, it works really well and it links up right away there's no there's no lag it works really well that's really really cool yep. um and then um i mean i guess some other things i want to talk about is the value on this vehicle so talk me through kind of the options you got on this one and what your sticker price was sure um so this is the field master um not the trial master the trial master is um, their hardcore 4x4 that has all the hardcore options from the from the start. I wanted something that had leather. I wanted something a little more comfortable. Um, so I went with the with the Fieldmaster. Um, obviously, still have the front and rear lockers. Still have all the off-road bits. Um, the one thing I did not do was the dual battery. Um, I plan on doing that on my own. And I added the uh, Safari windows. Um, obviously, the the saddle leather in here. I'm not sure if um, it's cool. Yeah, yeah so it's, it's really got nice. saddle leather on the, the steering wheel and uh, you know the handles here and on the e brake and stuff like that. Um, and then other than that, it's you know did the the electrical panel, the, you know, all the switches and all that stuff. Um, my out the door price with the $1,600. Uh, destination fee, I believe, was right around 89. Okay. So, 87-ish, um, I think, was what my build was. Um, can't remember the exact number, but very close to that. And and how do you feel that lines up in terms of like value? Do you think it's good value? Do you think it's too expensive for what you're getting? It's it's expensive. I, not expensive. I think it's a little more. I mean, here's the deal. Like, I went on Jeep's website three or four weeks ago, and I built a Rubicon exactly how I'd want it. Mm -hmm. A four by E with you know you know, all the options, steel bumpers, whatever. And it was like $72,000 or something like that. And for $10,000, $15,000 more, I would much rather have a purpose built, built um, I won't say custom, it's not a custom car, but more of a, um, something that's not- Bespoke. A bes yeah, exactly, yeah, yes. Right. And not something that you see every other car. You know, Jeeps and Forerunners and Tacos, they're, you know, they're, they're all over in Colorado. And sure. I wanted something that was a little bit different but still got me to the places that I wanted to go. And there's, I can't think of a better option at this point. Now, in terms of what you're gonna do with this vehicle, mm -hmm. I, I mean, I noticed you have the front and the rear lockers mm -hmm. and um, you got the KO2 tires and that kind of yep. thing. I mean, are you planning on wheeling this? this absolutely, yeah. absolutely, yep. So my main concern right now is um, when I sold my previous build, I sold my rooftop tent, I sold it all with it. So I need to find a rack and a tent so that this summer, once, or I guess this spring, once we start you know, warming up a little bit, don't really love camping too much in the winter. <laughs> um, we, we, so we can get out right away. Um, the only issue is this, this vehicle is tall right. and you know, I have standard eight foot garage doors and you put a rack and a tent and that's about it. So I have to figure out how I'm going to make it all work with a lift and tires and a rack. Um, because eventually I, I want to lift it. I want to put some bigger tires on it too. And I think it's going to require some garage modification. So it's going to be a little bit of a lengthy process for me, but absolutely right off the bat, I plan on four wheeling with this thing. It's not going to be a garage queen. It's not going to be something that just looks pretty and, and comes out when it's sunny. Like we plan on, you know, using, using this it. thing. Yeah. And I think that might be my hardest, uh, my hardest step to get over is yes this thing is nice it's really expensive and i cannot 
wait to get it off road. <laughs> but there's also part of me that's like, that's still a lot of, you know, it's expensive paint and you know, I'm gonna be getting scratches yeah, right. and stuff. But, and I just, I have to not care. And I know that, you know, like with the Jeep, I just never cared. FJ never cared. And I think it's because like, yeah, I've been waiting for so long that like, I just wanted this to be like babied at least for a little bit. I know, keep it nice. Keep it nice, yeah. <laughs> exactly. So last question for you, what's kind of the thing that's most surprised you and what's the thing that you wish that Ineos would change? Hmm. Well, I think the thing that's most surprising is like you said already, the build quality out of a first vehicle coming out of the very a brand new company. Um, you just look back on so many cars that have come out, you know, first time cars. And when we, back in the day, we bought the Mazda 3, the very first Mazda 3, you know, in the early 2000s. And oh my gosh, so many issues. And I told myself I would never buy a first car, you know, whatever. <laughs> but it was kind of nice because we had, you know, they did obviously a lot of t testing and tuning and whatever. But then we also had almost a year of them being out in, in, in you know, in Australia and parts of the UK and, you know, whatever. So mm -hmm. they've worked out a lot of that, but just overall, just the sense of just solid quality. It just feels so built, so well built in here. The door slams are great. The, the leather, the seats, you know, these are Recaro seats. You know, you've got bolstering on an off-road vehicle from the factory. I mean, it's just like they've thought of so many things and their engineers are, you know, thinking ahead and you know getting input from other off-roading you know companies and, and products that didn't have certain things and they would add it so i just think it was a you know it's just been such a great experience there hasn't really been anything that i've not liked about mm -hmm. the experience of it other than the weight <laughs> yeah um you know it's been a long time coming it's been fun it's been a it's been a wait but my goodness it's it seems at least so far it seems like it's worth it and what do you what's one thing you think Ineos should should address going forward um that's a tricky one i might have to think on this for a second sure um yeah you know like sway bar disconnect yeah i think fuel that economy. might yeah so i think the fuel economy and you know maybe just I don't think the fuel economy necessarily is is what's bad. It's the actual size of the tank. Um, okay. It's like, what is it? Twenty three gallons, I think. Mm -hmm. You know, and it, you know, roughly, I'm getting between fifteen and sixteen, seventeen ish. That's kind of fifteen to seventeen is what I'm I'm getting. Yeah. Um, you know, for most trails and stuff in Colorado, it's not going to be an issue. But when you start going on on longer, you know, more of the overlanding, you know, long bouts without gas, that could definitely become a problem. Um, one of the things I am excited about though is the aftermarket support for potentially a, an auxiliary tank or something bigger or something that we could use. I know there's there's space back there. Um, but yeah, I think maybe get, you know uh, gas capacity maybe, uh, sway bar disconnects, and then just, I don't know, I think they kind of nailed like they it. They kind of nailed it. Like, yeah. I hate to say that. I don't want to be like, oh, this is the best car ever. But it's true. Like, they really did an awesome job right off the bat. What about the BMW shifter? Yeah. Yeah. It, it's cool. I like you it. You like it? I'm okay. okay. There I'm you okay go. There you they go. They could have done something <laughs> a little different in there, I think. You know, this this shifter is kind of cool. This looks like yeah, the transfer cool. case. Yeah. Transfer, yeah. Um, transfer case. But. Well, Mark, thank you so much. Yeah, I absolutely. really appreciate this opportunity oh, to talk yeah, to you. It's been fun. Um, and um, yeah, I, uh, I have to say, I mean, initially, I, I think they did a really cool job. It mm -hmm. feels, it drives like a perfect combination between a new G Wagon and a new Wrangler JL mm -hmm. with the hard, it means the BMW engine. There's yep. no way around it. Yeah, yep. it's yep. really cool. Yep. All right, everybody, thank you so much for watching Car Chat here at the TFL Talk YouTube channel. And Nathan, if people want to watch more of us, should they subscribe? They should subscribe. And remember that all of our our recent stories go up and including our clips on alltfl.com. Yep, for sure. Yep, be sure to check that out. We got a lot going on around the office. We'll see you on the next episode. Bye guys.